A new AI tool was released recently called The Devil. Wait, did we get that wrong? I'm just kidding. It's called Devin and it scared the holy ghost out of software developers all over the world. Made by Cognition Labs, Devin is the new state of the art on the SWE Bench coding benchmark and successfully passed practical engineering interviews from leading AI companies and even completed real jobs on the freelancing platform Upwork. They pitch it as the world's first fully autonomous AI software engineer. Their blog states Devin is a tireless, skilled teammate equally ready to build alongside you or independently complete tasks for you to review. So let's do it like this. First, let's go through everything that they solve and then I'll tell you from my experience of building a slightly similar tool last year on how I think the software engineering job might evolve. Yes, I do not think software engineering jobs are completely going to disappear. I do think they will evolve. So I want to give you my thoughts, but first let's see what Devin can do. Number one, Cognition Lab states that Devin can solve problems in unfamiliar technologies that it has no exposure to, which means it can read documentation and make decisions. This is not actually a surprise because GPT-4 can do this too, at least for problem statements of small context length. Number two is that Devin can make apps end to end. If you give Devin an app idea, it will solve it for you, including planning out all the features and edge cases. It even writes tests for you. But you know what? Again, GPT-4 can kind of do this for you. The third is that Devin is not actually foolproof. It does make mistakes, but it's also fully capable of debugging the code. Also, if you give it a GitHub issue and the code base, it can get to solving it. Again, GPT-4 can do this too. And almost a year ago, we had self-healing code that on the back of GPT-4 could write some code. And then if that code produces a bug, you can enter that as a bug to GPT and GPT will tell you how to solve it next. Not only that, Devin can also contribute to mature production repositories. In this example, Devin solves a bug with logarithm calculations in the SymPy Python algebra system. Devin sets up the code environment, reproduces the bug, and then codes and tests the fix on its own, according to their blog. GPT can't do this yet because it needs something else to help it to push to GitHub directly. Now, the question you may be asking here is, well, Varun, GPT seems to do a lot of this. And we do know GPT writes code, but why doesn't it make full apps properly yet? Well, that's because GPT has ADHD. It has attention deficiency, and it constantly gets sidetracked when you use it as an agent. And that is the entire reason the technology QSTAR was all over Twitter a few months ago, because it helps GPT plan better. GPT is pretty bad at reasoning and planning, especially over long sequences. And I want to explain exactly how, because I have some amount of experience with this. If Devin has actually solved this, there are far more implications than just code. And it also means that Devin need not have to build their own LLM at all. They are completely comfortable working on top of GPT or Claude. Okay, now before I continue, I want to tell you why I am even a competent person to explain this to you or explain the implications. Sometime over the last year, we built a tool called AutoCode Pro. We actually built it as an experiment. It was an AI agent to help you write entire apps. We started with Chrome extensions because they were an easier problem to solve. They have very few external dependencies. But I've also seen our own app make a forum app too, complete with provisions for a MySQL database. Now, I didn't build this to build a business around it. I'm from India and over the last few years, I've learned a lot about what markets and ideas you can actually tackle, seriously tackle from here. Solving software engineering is an extremely competitive battle that even OpenAI will fight in the future. And you need between 100 mil to a few billion dollars to even compete. And I don't think we have a shot at winning that. It's not just a capital issue, it is also a skill issue. And spending that much money, it's not even a guarantee of winning. It's just the price to play. So we still built the product because I wanted to learn a lot about AI last year. And the only way I know how to learn is by building things. So we built the product to learn and test the capabilities of AI agents. Before us, an open source repository called Small had appeared on GitHub that inspired us to build out AutoCode. In fact, we still use a bit of their logic in the code base. Devin seems to use the exact same strategy that Small and AutoCode use. Here it is. Number one, when you're given a problem, you first make a plan of how you're going to solve it. Then one by one, you double click into each of those line items and then set up a plan for how you will solve that. All of this is called the dev loop. And while it made it very easy for AutoCode or Small or even another repository called GPT Engineer to solve simple problems, it still failed at complicated problems because the dev loop 
constantly get sidetracked. The hardest challenge is to keep the agentic loop on track. It tends to derail and start doing other stuff or get stuck in pockets of nonsense. The main problem is they get sidetracked into doing tasks they think are important but are either unsolvable or are uncompletable by a machine. For example, if something in the planning phase is unsolvable, for example, use XYZ API to pull this data, but that API doesn't exist or is unreachable, it will forever be stuck there and unstucking it is a pretty manual task. All the way back when AutoGPT was a thing, it used to get stuck in these things we used to call pockets. And we started calling this phenomenon pocketing, where the agent gets stuck doing something stupid and doesn't know how to come out of it. For example, in some stages, suppose you tell the agent, well, go find all the news for today, and suppose it decides to find the news from BBC, and it requires a login. I'm just giving you a hypothetical example. Maybe it requires a login, then it just gets stuck there. It doesn't know what to do next. And even though it asks you for the username and password, there are a lot of issues that prevent an agent like this from signing in through a browser to some other website, and it kind of gets stuck there, so you have to help it out. The real measure of all these tools, including Devin, is to see how they perform end-to-end -end without manual intervention when they hit a pocket. Devin seems to solve 13.86% of tasks, which is much better than previous agents, but it's still nowhere close to solving software engineering. Okay, so here are my thoughts and here I see this space evolving. I just want to add one caveat that even though I've been right many instances over the last one year, and I only credit the fact that we've built stuff. Whether rapper or not, doesn't matter. We've built stuff, we've learned some of this, but I can still be wrong. I went on a podcast many moons ago, even before we had built the thumbnail tool Alpha CTR, and I said that AI might replace creative jobs. And a lot of people in the comments, they massacred me, right? They called me all sorts of names. But as we've learned many moons later, it has become true. So remember, these are experiences building a tool like this with similar strategy. These are meant to be taken as light posts, not as gospel. And hopefully with this, I'm able to tell you what problems existed with this technology then and now. So in the past, a lot of this pocketing process took place. It would get stuck too often, like AutoGPT, if you remember AutoGPT. And it could get stuck on the silliest of things. And like I said, it's sort of a loop. So in the planning phase, you come up with four to five tasks. And when you go through each task, more planning needs to be done. This can also sort of become like an infinite loop if it doesn't know when the task set is completed. If it doesn't know that, hey, we've accomplished the goals we set out to accomplish for this task item. Again, this is like a pocket that needs to be solved. So what I believe is that the number of pockets that you need to solve were a lot a year ago. You needed to help it everywhere. And with advances in planning and decision making and knowing when to stop the loop or when the subtask is done, the amount of unpocketing help these tools need is lower. So your job, evolves to helping this junior software engineer in your team that's a bot with areas it is stuck in. Right now, it's going to get stuck very often, so it needs your help, but over time, maybe it will need less and less of your help. The second important thing is the prompt itself. Now, if you are building something very standard and studied, like a food delivery app, GPT or Claude itself will give you a decent plan. It can write the exact product plan for you, the exact feature set for you. But many of these cases in the real world, and we've learned this, are nuanced. Which means that what is required might be specific to certain countries, certain rules, certain regulations, certain user behaviors. I'll give you a very interesting example from India. A Swiggy product manager once told me that every few seconds their app would go in the background and then come back. And it was happening a lot. And for a while, they didn't know what was going on. And at some point, they realized that the Swiggy app, when it was going in the background, the other food delivery app, which is Zomato, was being brought to the foreground. What people were doing was comparing prices. That's a behavior that looks like it's more specific to low-income countries like India. So what will really be expected of the product spec that you give the tool is your understanding of the market and the users. So being able to clearly tell an AI what you want what people call prompt engineering, but what I just tend to call high quality writing is very important. As you know, writing is a reflection of your thinking and what you understand. So quality thinking and understanding your user becomes very important. Now you can argue that Varun, this is more a product manager role than a developer role. But like I said, these are all artificial constraints we've created. Okay, this person, this role does these tasks, this role does these tasks, but actually in the real world that doesn't exist. People can do multiple things and more is going to be expected as these tools come out. The more clear and concise you can write, the closer your generated app is to what you want. This might be you writing one spec sheet of exactly what you want, some mockups of screens, and wrestling with the outputs of the AI to figure out which of the things it has generated is closest to what you want. So far, we have said that the role involves unpocketing, which is unstucking the bot, 
and clear writing. The last piece is about deployment and scaling decisions. So let's just assume for this conversation that you can't optimize further than what Devin has written. But you can make decisions on where and how you're going to put this up and how you are going to handle scale. Finally, it's about users. There's no point building an app if users don't come. And if you heard me screaming over the last few years, building products is getting easier and easier. Gaining distribution is much harder today. This is not only because of AI, but because of abstractions. About 11 or 12 years ago, when I started building my first software company called JobSpy, my first serious one, it was a challenge to even do simple things like authentication with OTP. Today, there are like 50 service providers and open source repositories that offer this. Even payment gateways, back then, you had to work with the bank payment gateway API directly. You had to work with it raw. We didn't have tools like Razorpay or Stripe. With more people building smaller components you can use, you save a lot of time that allows you to build faster. But it's also allowing everyone else to build faster, which means that the challenge then quickly evolves from can I build the thing and can I build it quickly to can I gain users and find interesting problems to solve with technology. Now, so far, the first three job tasks that I've described are exactly what senior engineers or even your CTO or CPO would do. Unstucking juniors, unpocketing juniors, planning exactly what needs to be built, writing a spec sheet for it, and making scaling decisions. So if you're a senior engineer, you just got access to a massive team at a really low cost. And Devin allows every single software engineer to play one level up. You can play at a higher level of abstraction because you have a junior engineer to do the menial work for you. But your work is still to solve problems. A lot of engineers today are saying, I'm an expert at this particular technology, in this particular framework, in this particular stack, in this particular language. It's like it, you're being extremely specific about something that is actually fairly broad. The truth with young software engineers is changing how they think is actually very hard. I've hired over a thousand people in my life and over 500 of them have been software engineers. Remember, we ran a software consultancy many years ago. And to be honest, AOS Labs today hires a lot of software engineers. The problem is that in 2021, when startups were raising massive funding rounds, engineers were paid crazy amounts of money and there was a lot of competition. These same engineers were busy shopping offers and bragging on YouTube about how much money they made. They were also getting extremely specific about what you need to learn in the software engineering space. And I think that kind of hyper-specialization might not be good. The problem is that there was a sudden drop from there, even without AI, because of the funding crunch. A world with much less funding and jobs and egos were a little hurt. When I said a year ago that coding might come under threat with AI, the amount of damage I took from especially junior engineers was insane. It was pretty intense. And I wasn't actually used to that much hate. We made a reel many moons ago about how GPT was able to take some screenshot of something and generate the code for it. It's a very simple problem. And a lot of people said, oh, you're taking a very simple problem and you're saying, oh, now it's going to generate the entire front end for you. But that's not what we were saying. What we were saying is there's a trend line and we are slowly starting to be able to do things with technology that we were not able to do in the past in the exact same way. Taking a screenshot, using computer vision, and then regenerating that with code is very different from saying, oh, if you used a framework, this would be one line of code. So the comment section was so furious that we actually just stopped talking about this completely. I'll give you an example that doesn't involve AI, but something that happened in a previous company of mine. There was a front-end engineer at my company who just didn't want to use Tailwind or any CSS framework. He was what is known as a purist, who was like, I want to build this thing from scratch, otherwise no point in doing my job. It's just someone else's work that we're using. I explained to him that we don't want to repeat things from scratch. Otherwise, you should start writing assembly code. But the problem with purists is it starts becoming their identity, and that's a challenging thing to come out of. And that's why every week you have a new front-end framework show up. At this point, it's commercially useless, but it's engineer signaling. It's a software engineer showing another software engineer saying, look, I'm so good at this. Now, I understand some of these problems because I was kind of like that. And over the years, I've just become much more concerned about solving problems than what my identity is. I don't know today if I'm a content creator or an engineer or an entrepreneur or manager. I just don't even know. I don't even care about what tool I use anymore. I'm just like, this is the problem we solved. How can I solve it in the cheapest and most effective way possible? If it's an external tool, that's fine. The decision-making process of signaling and feeling good and validation from your peers is a sin of every industry. As an industry, you should be focused on your audience, your customer. And the minute you forget this and start signaling to your peers that, oh, look how awesome I am, you actually start getting into problems. Because if you truly loved solving problems, you would embrace new tools and new methods of doing things. In fact, most good engineers can break things apart and build them up. It's not just limited to being good at React. And one misconception is that, at least in India, lots of jobs are like pure software jobs or pure software problems to be solved. This is false. 
In B2B, one of my learnings, and I was wrong about this, so I'm going to be honest with you. Most of the companies are either doing exports. Yes, even the best product B2B companies are selling software abroad, not in India. You can build software from India, you can't sell it to India. Or they are services companies. Negligible amount of pure product software companies selling from India to India are doing well. In fact, if you find more than four or five pure B2B software companies in India selling to India and doing well, please tell me because those are the true unicorns. The definition of the word unicorn, by the way, is that these are mythical creatures that are not easily seen. On the other hand, our consumer successes in India, for example, Zomato or Urban Clap, are actually solving real world problems with technology. Or you need some moat, like Zerodha, where they have a license. Abhishek Bakshi, an investigative journalist who I think was pretty awesome, dug out a very interesting stat that there are less than 60 companies that make significant money from selling anything digitally on apps. There are less than 60 apps on the Play Store making more than a million dollars in ARR in selling something purely digitally. So it's clear that in India, at least with mobile apps, we are actually using software to solve real world problems than purely digital problems. An engineer, the word engineer, is not just limited to typing code in a particular framework or language. Look up the definition of engineering. The solution to the problem then, and even now, is to think one level up, is to actually become an engineer and solve problems. Siddhant from my team keeps saying this. He keeps saying that code may die this decade, but engineering will live on forever. I'm going to end this with a tweet from Elon a day ago. I do truly believe in this too. In the last few years, I've changed my life to be far more truth-seeking as I actually say AGI around the corner. I truly believe in this. And if this is true, it is better to lead a life not attached to careers and specific job roles and be extremely adaptable as time goes on. It's better to lead life as a series of projects and even if some aren't commercially successful, who cares? I built so many tools and projects last year, not as companies or jobs. I just had fun doing it. I just wanted to learn about it. And it looks strange to everybody that you're spending money building these things just to learn about stuff. But why not? In a world where AI and fusion technology just take over all economic output, the price of everything is going to drop to near zero. So you may not actually need money to live if the government figures out real estate and a roof over your head. I am okay living on very little money if I need to. In fact, I'm one of the most frugal people you will ever meet. And I always count my blessings that I got to at least work on some of these interesting things while other people don't even get that opportunity. You should go check out how much money the average Indian household actually lives on. Being attached to your job will give you nothing but suffering over the next few years if AI continues on this unchecked run. Be flexible and remember, we are all in the same boat. It's not like me saying that you will lose your job but I will be fine. AI will outclass me as much as it outclasses you. So we are all in the same boat. Lots of people say, oh pause it, stop it or it'll take 10 years or whatever. But this is all inevitable. If not 2 years, it'll take 5 years. If not 5, it'll take 10. At some point in human history, complete automation was bound to happen. If for a second you disconnect your life from the job, and you realize the point of life is to experience everything. And I don't know what the point of life is, right? But let's say my point of life is to experience as much as possible and seek the truth and not sit nine to five somewhere. You will see AI as liberation, not as the enemy. And until that point, there will be some turbulence as this mental adjustment to a world without jobs happens. Until that time comes, we will fight it. We won't go gently into that utopia. That's it for me. And remember, you should chart your own path. Nobody on the internet can tell you what to do. They can just give you their learnings and their thoughts. Bye.